Danny Bryant with uh, K-Scope 15 here with Tom Kite, architect, the Oracle Corporation. And we're going to be talking about the uh, database 12C. Thank you for joining us. No, thank you. Okay. So about two years ago, I want to say, Oracle released 12C to, uh, to the masses. And uh, so what's been going on for the last couple of years as it relates to some of the changes or anything that's going on in the, in the database? It was almost exactly two years ago. It was June 25th, uh, believe it or not. I, I remember that because that's my wife's birthday. So that was great to remember that. 12C came out. And uh, you know, there's a lot of great new stuff in the first release. But then a year later, just last July, uh, they came out with the first major patch set, so 12102 is out, and that included a lot of really cool stuff, not just patches to the database, but the new database in memory capability, a columnar data store as opposed to the row-based data store, as well as a, a new JSON document store for application developers. So not just DBA features, but actually something for the development world out there. You can sort of use the Oracle database as a NoSQL document store. So the same APIs you might use to a, a MongoDB or the Oracle NoSQL database are APIs you can use to the Oracle database. And the cool thing is if you stuff a JSON document into Oracle, you can immediately start using SQL against it, which opens it up for access to many more applications than if you just stuff it into a traditional NoSQL database. Sure. So talk to us about the in-memory database and the types of things that we can look at as it relates to performance, because I'm very sure that certain things are now just completely blowing previous versions of the database away as it relates to pulling information back out of those systems. You know, it's a sort of a it depends thing as to whether it's going to make your application go faster or not go faster. But uh, you know, today we are starting to see computers with more DRAM than database, right? So when I joined Oracle, if you were to buy a terabyte of memory in 1993, it would have cost like $26 million. And you wouldn't have been able to use it in anything because the most memory you could address was two gigabytes. Uh, the theoretical maximum size of an Oracle SGA for version 7.3 was 1.75 gigabytes. Nobody ever hit that because it was just too expensive. Now we have tens of terabytes in machines occasionally, and all of a sudden we have the ability to load a database totally in memory. And you might say, well, we could do that with database blocks in the buffer cache, but that's not really good enough because the data is organized to access a row at a time. OLTP, insert a row, update a row, delete a row. Analytics, get me three columns from a billion rows and squish them down into 100 rows aggregate them, sort them, and return them. So it's a totally different problem. And trying to get three rows out, or three columns out of a hundred is hard enough because, you know, we got to parse over a lot of columns to get to the fifth column, the tenth column, the twentieth column. And then we've got to do that billions of times as we go through database blocks. With the in-memory column or store, we'll store column five right here, column seven, column twenty, when we want those three columns, we can go directly to that data. It's already pre-parsed. It's in the format we need for the analytics. And we can process two, three orders of magnitude more rows per second than we can if we have to get them off of database blocks. So from an analytic perspective, if you need a couple of columns out of a lot, and you need it for many rows, and you're going to filter that information or aggregate it down into a few number of rows so that a human can use it, you know, the, the in-memory makes a, a lot of sense. Nice. So along with uh, the column that stores the data, aren't there some indexing type things where we're looking at uh, certain blocks that are sorted in a particular way that lets us even get closer to the data that we want to pull out of this? Yeah, it, it's sort of an anti-indexing scheme. Because normally you think of an index as a way to find data. It's like star where last name equals kite, go to an index, find those rows. The indexes that we're using within memory tell us where not to find data. And they're storage indexes, uh, very similar to what we used in Exadata. But as we're organizing the information in memory, we're remembering for large segments of memory what the minimum and maximum values are for certain data elements, or even some uh, distinct values uh, for data elements in that memory range. And when you issue a query and say, find me all the data related to this, 
we can exclude from consideration large segments of memory because we know that that value you want can't possibly exist in this in-memory unit. And so we'll just skip over that. And so since the fastest way to do something is not to do it in the first place, uh, that helps us go much faster. So they're, they're not conventional indexes. They don't help us find data. They help us not find data. Very nice, very nice. So can we talk a little bit about the database and how it's helping evolve the cloud? And we always hear it's in the cloud. We want to do this in the cloud. And how is that database supporting those efforts to move applications in and make them easier for developers, DBAs to work with? Yeah, now you're starting to talk about some of the tools like Enterprise Manager, a framework around the database so that we can requisition the database, provision the database, but also database features like uh, multi-tenant, which was first released two years ago with 12101. Uh, that's a capability to have multiple databases. And a database, if you remember, is a set of files plugged into one instance. So I can fire up a database instance and the developer can come along and say, I, I need a test database. And 30 seconds later, they'll have a database. We didn't have to install software. We didn't have to create a new Oracle instance. We didn't have to configure the Oracle instance. It didn't take us hours to create this database. It literally takes seconds to create a, a copy of a seed database so the developer has something up and running and working quickly. Or point to a development instance and say, I need a clone of that. I, I, I would like our development database to try something. It's going to potentially be destructive, it might be the worst thing I ever did, but I'd like to try it out. And so the DBA can very easily clone those databases you know, within one multi-tenant database, create up to 250 or so uh, pluggable databases. Now, it's become so easy to create databases that it makes it easy for a DBA to set up an instance but then allow developers to requisition resources on that, or even to allow departments, if you will, to requisition resources so that they can run uh, their own internal private cloud if they'd like, or go to a public cloud. I mean, there's nothing faster than just going to a website, plugging in your credit card number, and you know, 30 seconds later, you've got an Oracle database that you know is gonna be backed up by somebody who knows how to back it up and recover it. Uh, they're going to be monitoring it to make sure it's up, not down. Uh, when patching comes along to be performed in the database, they take care of doing that. So it's automating a, a lot of the things that, you know, would get in the way of a developer who wants to just try something out quick. Sure. I guess it's simple as being able to requisition or provision database. I'm done. I can just say, hey, DBA, I'm finished with what we're doing either migrate to your production system or through your type of change control and then blow those things away without. Move it, move something you have in-house to the cloud, move something you have in the cloud, cloud to in-house. So yeah, it, it's all about putting it wherever you want it, whenever you want it, and perhaps using both of them at the same time. Most of the year, I've got enough resources in-house. At the end of the year, I go to close the books. I need a little bit more. I can add some of the public cloud, offer some processing there, and then bring it all back in-house again. I don't, I don't have to be sized for maximum capacity, just average. Great, great. And so it looks like a lot of thought was really kind of taken into account developers needing to be able to get in and do some things without burdening your DBAs on like development environments or test environments. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's... That's a good way of putting it, the uh, developer not being a burden on the DBA. <laughs> but in many respects, it's going back to the way we used to do it. Uh, when I started development in the 1980s, we would have an LPAR on a mainframe, which is a virtual machine, basically. And the database would be running inside of that, and it was all centrally managed. Uh, you know, people didn't just go out and buy a mainframe for themselves and stick it under their desk. It was a resource that had to be professionally managed, monitored, and maintained. Client server took us into an environment where people had the computer under their desk, right? And servers just popped up everywhere and anywhere, and people were trying to run them themselves. And now we're going back into a consolidation phase where everything's coming back under centralized control, and whether that is happening inside your company or down the street at you know, an ISP, a hosting provider, uh, you really can't tell. 
I think that's it. I mean, I think we've gotten done a lot with uh, the database and you know getting that stuff out there. So I really appreciate your time and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, you too, thanks. Once again, this is Danny Bryant and we're at Case Scope 15 with Tom Kite. Thank you.